Year. Let's get more on uh, commodities, and we're joined today by Jonathan Barrett, who is the managing director of Commodity Broking Services, which provides commodity trading and fund management services. And uh, let me just tell you that Jonathan correctly predicted a 25% gain in copper back in June. So, uh, Jonathan, good to have you yeah. back with us. Uh, let me, let's talk about yeah. copper first off, since, since we highlighted the uh, copper and lead predictions from Bob Tagai at the Sumitomo. You say that copper has come close to targets and is due for a correction right now. Yes, yeah, Susan, I think that's correct. It's, I think it's uh, over, the last, um, over the last couple of weeks, we're starting to get signals that perhaps we have gone a bit too far too fast. That 300, uh, 300 or $3 a pound level on COMEX for copper, in my mind, it was very hard for it to actually breach through it. And I think it was very hard for a lot of um, consumers or producers and fabricators to push these price rises through the market. And as a consequence, we started to see infantry builds. Um, a lot of infantry builds, obviously, in the LME and Shanghai. And I think the news from China the other day just triggered what we were all feeling. And then that's why we've just seen this quick sell-off. Well, let me just ask you, if that's the case, you expect copper to maybe correct in the uh, next while. Is this the best time to short copper? Well, look, it is. I think you can short copper on a breakthrough that uh, 270 level. I mean, one of the contra things is a lot of the data, particularly from, you know, the housing data, that's all been pretty positive over the last couple of days. So it's, it, it's tearing at us in terms of putting those shorts on. And remember, copper always does have a very tight supply issue. I think I'd only go short copper on a break through that 270 level because then I can probably from there see a decline of about 10% down to that 250 level. Obviously there are concerns in equity markets, economic performance and overcapacity in China and I think that might cause a correction that could ultimately see it to 250. Yeah, Jonathan, you were talking about the supply. Let's bring in the demand factor as well in this uh, tandem relationship. Are there really any reliable estimates right now on how much uh, China has stockpiled? Well, I think it, it is interesting because, um, yes, they certainly have uh, stockpiled. We don't understand to the full extent. But what we do find is that we get some seasonal buying starting to come through. And, uh, and I think that as we lead into the Northern Hemisphere winter, we'll actually find a lot of that actually taper off as well because they just can't put it through the system. So if anything, seasonally, I think we'll actually come off the boil. And I think that'll be one of the further advantages as to why we actually feel that we could see prices actually taper off. And, and in my mind, that's one of the keys, just purely also on a seasonal thing. And believe it or not, on that US dollar, because that US dollar, mm -hmm. in my mind, has failed to move lower. So there is a higher propensity, I think, for it to push higher. Uh, well, well, copper prices, how much higher can they gain? You heard uh, Bob Takai of Sumitomo Mitsui saying maybe prices will gain another 13% yeah. from here. What are your feelings? Hmm. Well, well I, don't, I don't think prices can actually move up from that level uh, too aggressively. Um, I still think there's more of an asset concern in China. I, I mentioned it was the US dollar, I think, that could push higher. But I think coming into the end of this year, I think copper's pretty much found its highs for the, for the year. And I'll probably see it start mm -hmm. to drift sideways and lower. I think the lowest end of that is around that 250. So I can't get overly bullish copper at the moment unless I get a critical concern in the supply chain. And what about lead prices? Uh, we started off the segment talking about, uh, you know, outlooks on, on lead as well. And uh, again, uh, you know, Sumitomo Mitsui uh, predicting a 16% uh, price gain. Is that too bullish? Yeah. Look, I, I can't see it at the moment. Um, I, I can start to see it when we observe what's happening in inf infantries. And, and when we start to get those builds in infantries, it's, we're not seeing, we're producing, but we're not seeing that actual consumption and that follow through. So I get a little bit concerned when I, when I see those builds and I start to feel back and I say, well, hey, hang on, we're not really going. And, and if we are going to go higher, what's actually going to force it to move higher? And I can't actually see those factors in the market at the moment, particularly when we do come down to a normal slowdown in the seasonal factors for demand for these metals. Yeah, so what's your call for lead prices then? Um, I'd like, I'd actually be more on the contra, and I'll actually see lead prices coming off by about that uh, 5 to 8 percent. All right. Well, let's move on and talk about oil because yep. what a dramatic drop for oil prices after that sell-off that we saw on Wall Street, which is uh, translating here to the Asia pack. And you're one of those in the bear camp, but you actually expect um, <laughs> oil prices to drop below $70 per barrel, which uh, they have already just overnight. <laughs> um, well, I have been bullish up until that 73, 74 level. 
and uh, obviously that turnaround. Yeah, some of the viewers, viewers, I think it'll be important to have a look at the technical analysis for crude at the moment. Once again, we're seeing builds occurring in the fundamental side. We're seeing a slowdown perhaps in some of this economic activity. Um, particularly in China or that excess overcapacity. But have a look at the trend channel on crude because it's basically about to hit uh, a, a low, a trend line that started when we had that low of around about 38, 30 in February. So if that area breaks and we've got it around about 66.50, then I think crude could actually come back to US 60, 62 a barrel. But I'm focused on that trend to see if it breaks, that trend line mm -hmm. to see if it breaks. And if it does, I think I'll be going short. In fact, we are already short. All right. Okay, Jonathan, I'll get levels from you after this break. We have to get to commercial <laughs> right now. Let's get back to our guest this morning on commodities with Jonathan Barrett of uh, Commodity Broking Services joining us uh, from Sydney. And uh, Jonathan, before we went to commercial break, you said that uh, this is a good opportunity to short oil prices. What do you think is going to be the floor? So I think actually one on that uh, 67 level, I think uh, we'll probably see it through 66. The key, I think, is following that trend line. Um, that's an important trend that I think a lot of traders are actually following. A break of that should put a floor in around that US 60 level. Uh, but I think I must have to stress that trend is a trend that's been true for a while. And if it does break through that level, then we feel that US 60 is just around the corner. Okay, so if it, it hits that floor of $60 per barrel, is it time to then buy on that dip? Yeah, no, we're, we're comfortable. Once we see the price action around that level, then we're happy to load up again and uh, look for an ultimate assault from there through that 74 and a half. And that's the key on the top side. A break through that level up there sends us up into a new and higher price range. So if you look at that range there, then, you know, 74.50 on the top is the one to break. Yeah, 74.50, that's what you're looking for on the uh, top side to break. Uh, when are we going to see that? Is that for next year? Uh, I think that is, that is looking for next year. Um, I think that's looking more to see, see how the hurricane season unfolds. Remember, we're just coming into that. Uh, if we get any mm -hmm. concerns on what's happening in the hurricane era in terms of supply, then obviously that placates any issue we have in terms of prices going low, because that is a key. So we have to be mindful of that. But definitely, I think if we get through 74.50, then I think I'd want to trade with that break. Yeah, Jonathan, uh, did you hear Christian Smollinger, our uh, resident uh, oil reporter, who's talking about these levels and trading volumes? At, and because we're really yeah. in the uh, dog days of summer, that uh, these volumes are pretty low. Do you think we'll see more, uh, oh, I guess, uh, oil trading action, say, starting next week or so? And how does that impact prices? Well, I think we will. I hope so. Um, in terms of the volatility, obviously, there's still a few concerns over the speculative activity there. Um, but I think this volume will pick up. And I think people see any dip as an opportunity because I think we are going to see more of a recovery and more demand. And on the back of that, prices should eventually trade higher. But, but markets go side, don't go always up one way. They do correct. And I think what we're going to see is just a correction in order to allow us to come back onto the market. All right, Jonathan, we're running out of time here, but let me quickly get on to another commodity topic, and that's uh, platinum at this point. And you say platinum uh, looks pretty interesting these days. In fact, uh, you have a more bullish view on platinum than the analysts on our Bloomberg uh, survey. Why is that? What do you see? <laughs> well, what we're seeing, I mean, I mean, just purely started on the fact that, that, that platinum has not moved um, for quite some time. When you look at the highs and you compare platinum to gold, Platinum's $1,000 off its highs, where gold's only about $84 off its highs. So when you can start to see a few supply issues on the horizon, in terms of labour disputes in South Africa, where they produce 80% of the global supply of platinum, and you start to feel that, that we're getting into a seasonal demand for gold, then we actually feel that platinum is the one that's underpriced. So a breakthrough, okay. 1240, 1250, we'll see it higher. Mm -hmm. All right, Jonathan, we quickly have to take this viewer email. This is coming no from uh, Kumar. Yeah. He wants to ask about China virtually cornering the uh, commodity markets. He says, at what stage do you think other nations uh, short of commodities will actually come in to buy on these dips, or are they so desperate that they'll buy at any stage? Um, I think, I think a, 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 lot of, um, a lot of countries are looking for that, that infrastructure build. Um, and, and I think that any dip you'll find, a lot of those governments that look for infrastructure will actually come to play on any dip because it just makes sense. You know, rather than buying copper as we had it around 12,000, you can buy it at six or 7,000 at the moment. So I think we'll get support from for those governments looking for infrastructure on any dip. 
China, mm -hmm. it has always been placated as the one that likes to, uh, to be the leader. Just look at the size of the economy. Four trillion okay. as opposed to 14 Jonathan, trillion. Jonathan, yep. Jonathan, we're out of time, unfortunately, but uh, it's okay, always Susan. a pleasure to talk to you. Jonathan Barrett, the okay. Commodity Broking okay. Services.